This from the One X Drum and Bass Mix Show is giving you a mini lecture on the old 60s soul recording. Well, it just so happens this is no ordinary 60s soul record. This recording contains a six second drum solo, which is one of the most sampled breaks of all time. It was a popular sample used in early hip hop records during the 80s. Then it cropped up in loads of old school rave tracks. It became one of the foundation stones of jungle in the 90s, and it's still going strong in drum and bass today. Not to mention all the other tracks which feature it in one form or another. There are loads of websites, databases, and Facebook groups devoted to the subject. And for some reason, DJs and producers, and myself, are totally obsessed with it. I warn you, we are entering serious geek territory here. So, what does this drum break actually sound like? Well, this is it, coming up right about now. And there you have it. That's what's known as the Amen Break. And this is the story of the most sampled six second drum solo in the world. So even if you've never heard of the Amen Break before, trust me, you have heard the Amen Break once in your life. Amy's used it. So have Oasis. Prodigy absolutely caned it. And you hear in every episode of Futurama. It's in the theme track. And we haven't even got started on drum and bass yet. I'm going to be chatting to some of the fellow Amen heads. James Laville. We're sort of like finding a blueprint to the music. Ray Keith. We chopped it, we broke it, we reversed it. Chase and Status. I don't know if the music would even exist without it. Fabio and Groove Rider. It's got this kind of overpowering, overwhelming presence. Dillinger, Alec Empire, J Magic. A couple of years ago, it all my people stopped using it, but it's back with a vengeance suddenly. DJ Slipmat and Wickerman to answer some of the questions that you've always bugged me about this break. How did it go from a 60s B side to wind up in some of the key hip hop tracks of the 80s? Why are so many producers in all kinds of genres obsessed with this break? Would jungle and drum and bass even exist without this Amen break? And what do the original band, the Winstons, think about all of this? Not everyone knows the story behind the Amen Break. I've got no idea. <laughs> I just know it's been used in a million and one tunes and it's going to be used in a million and one other tunes. Um, oh, I can't remember the name of the tune they wrote. I think it was in, in, in the 60s. It was... Oh, was it, no, no, was it, no, no, no. It was the track called Amen Brother. And it, I can't remember who it was no, by. No, I'd even question whether or not they were a... A black or white band? Maybe they were a white band. They were, weren't they? Were they? No, they weren't. It was a soul band. Although, some had obviously done their homework. Yeah, I mean, it's like the the Winston tried right? that, that seven inch, uh, and the B side was called uh, uh, Amen Brother, right? Which was kind of a, uh, I don't know, a live version of what seemed to be some sort of like a hymn or something like that. We used to go to the Wag Club in Wardour Street and uh, the DJ used to play that track. Even then, all the jazz boys and the soul boys would go mad when they heard that little break. So I think it's about time we told you the full story of the Amen break. Behind the scenes, behind the headline. This is BBC Radio 1 Extra Story. What I really wanted to do was track down the guy who actually played the drums to find out how it all began. Unfortunately, the drummer Gregory C. Coleman died back in 1996. But I did find out one of the original members of the Winstons is still alive. He's the singer, Richard L. Spencer, and he owns the copyrights to the recording, so he sent off a couple mails to see if he'd be up for speaking to us. But back to the story. We're going to do a song that you never heard before. I thought I should find out more about sampling, so I hooked up with someone who was a part of the early hip-hop scene in New York. My name is Steve Stein, professionally known as Steinsky, and I'm one half of the hip-hop production team known as Double D and Steinsky. We made uh, some hip-hop collages called The Lessons back in the 80s and early 90s. The torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. Lesson three. They are 
kind of non sequitur left turn collages. Most of them don't have a specific point so much other than to get people's hips moving. Some of the original rap records, and I say that in quotes, were people rapping over disco bands, some of which you know, were playing really hot grooves, but they were live groups. The idea of making a record using something pre-recorded as a sample started happening in the mid-80s. Uh, James Lavelle. People were taking, you know, records that had long, really cool breaks and back-to-backing those and creating more, more of a rhythm for people to dance to and get into the groove rather than a song kind of constantly chopping and changing because um, it's all about the groove. And at that time, it was very eclectic and you'd hear stories of people playing, you know, craft work with a record like Apache, Gary Newman, and, and you know, and it was very, very, a very, um, a real mix. There were all the classic hip-hop breaks that people had been rapping over as people like, you know, Grandmaster Flash and other DJs, you know, Jazzy J, Red Alert, would mix back and forth between them. So you had Scorpio by Dennis Coffey. You had Funky Drummer by James Brown. A lot of James Brown stuff. And there was, you know, all these, you know, classic breaks. The Parliament break, I, it's either Parliament or Funkadelic, it's called Good Old Music. I could probably listen to a loop of that for three or four hours and remain incredibly happy. To me, the, the holy grail of, all, of, of the beginning of hip-hop was a series of records that came out called Octopus Breaks. And they later became a series called Ultimate Breaks and Beats. Basically, they were a compilation of all the cool records that came out of disco that people wanted to take the drum beats and cut up. Those were the first records that I went to New York to buy when I was 17, was to get, or, you know, to go to places like Downtown and Rock and Soul and get these compilations because they were just, it was, it was sort of like finding a blueprint to the music. Ultimate Beats and Breaks was um, a guy named Lenny who was a, uh, a, a limousine driver in the Bronx, uh, who was also a record collector. And he was also very tight with uh, some of the cats in the Zulu Nation. So they would say, oh, you know, we're, we, we, want, we want to get some more breaks. And he would sell them breaks. You could buy Ultimate Breaks and Beats at about three or four stores downtown and a couple of uptown stores. And there were, I think, in the end, there may have been more than 20 volumes. Each one had three or four complete songs on each side with a break in it. So that was, if it was a very short break, it was edited to be looped so you could use it as a DJ without too much of a hassle or you could take it out in the studio. I've got so many copies of all the breaks and beats. I, must, I think I must have bought it every time I went to New York. For it was sort of a staple diet of DJing. If you if you sort of got somewhere and you'd forgotten records, you just went to Rock and Soul and bought a load of Ultimate Breaks and Beats. <laughs> the Winston's Amen Brother appeared on the first official Ultimate Beats and Breaks record, which explains why it was used in so many hip hop tracks. But at this point, it didn't stand out from the crowd. The Amen Break wasn't considered for the most part, at least not in the people that I was running with, anything particularly special. It was a break. It was a good break. There were lots of good breaks. But the records it appeared on did make an impact in the UK. Tracks like Salt and Pepper. Nena Cherry. And the classic NWA Straight Outta Compton. Durin. What's up? Tell him where you're from. Straight out of Compton. Another crazy ass. For punks, I smoke yo, my rap gets bigger. I'm a bad mother, and you know this. But the won't show this. But I don't give a f. I'ma make my snaps. If not from the records, from jacking a crap, it's like burglary. The definition is jacking. But when I legally on, it's all packing. Shoot a motherfucker in a minute. I'll find a good piece of and go and finish. it. So if you're out of show in the front row, I'ma call you a Dirty ass. You probably get mad like a bitch supposed to. But that shows me slut your 
fucking post to a crazy motherfucker from the street. Attitude legit, cause I'm tearing up shit. Empty rain controls are automatic. For any dumb motherfucker, it starts static. Not on my hand, cause I'm a hand itself. Every time, I pull an AK on the shelf. Security is maximum, and that's a law. R E N spells red, but I'm wrong. See, cause I'm a motherfucking killer. The definition is clear, you're the witness of a killing. That's taking place without a clue. And once you're on the scope, yeah, it's yeah. through. Look, you might take it as a trip, but a nigga like Ren is on the gang to tip straight out of Compton. Compton, Compton, Compton. <laughs> Is his name and the boys coming straight out of Compton? It's a brother that I'll smother your mother and make your sister think I love her. Dangerous motherfucking ways in hell. And if I ever get caught, I make bail. See, I don't give a f that's the problem. I see a motherfucking cop, I don't dodge him, but I'm smart. Lay low, free for a while. And when I see the punk pass, I smile. To me, it's kind of funny. The attitude showing driving, but don't know where the fuck he going, just rolling. Looking for the one they call easy, but it's a flash. They never see. Never seen like a shadow in the dark Except when I am low You see a rocket jump over our hesitation And hear the scream of the one who got the land penetration Feel a little gust of wind and I'm jet But leave a memory, no one will be forgetting So what about the f*** who got shot? You think I give a damn about a fan of sucker? This is an autobiography of the E And if you ever f*** with me, you get taken By a stupid dope brother who will smother Word to the mother Compton, 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 Compton. BBC Radio One Extra Story. When you look back at when British hip hop first developed its voice, and you had artists like, I suppose, Hijack. A lot of it was really, it was really fast and heavy. Hijack's premier production presents Hold No Hostage. Extra special dedications goes out to the people of Brixton, Stockwell, Clapham, Vauxhall. The records that were really popular at the time from America were things like Public Enemy. And for some reason that hardcore sound, I think, just resonated here. Records like King of the Beats, which sampled the Amen break, and those records were really popular, those kind of cut and paste DJ scratch records. And I just think that that break always had the most power. It's such a tough, driving sound. Bust that groove! So at the time, UK rappers were heavily influenced by the US. But how else were those hip-hop breaks also being used in the UK music scene? Hardcore, you know the score. Yep, it was all about the old-school rave anthems. And here's the godfather of breakbeat hardcore, DJ Slipmap. And really the UK breakbeat sort of rave scene come off at the back of the US hip hop thing. Come on, let's have some fun! The whole UK scene was all about sampling. Acid, the word actually comes from sort of burning other people's music, little bits of vocal and stuff, and then obviously the breakbeat, the Amen, and lots and lots of James Brown. Come on, let's have some fun! For me, it started with. Obviously ourselves, SL2, and then you had people like Shut Up and Dance that were really sort of pioneering that sound. We was all into the, you know, the hip-hop stuff as well. It was just so nice to slam in a heavy breakbeat on top of those house beats. Just give it that extra sort of energy. I think the first tune we used, Aiming Break, was an SL2 track called Drum Beats. The SMD tracks, a few of them had the, the Amen break. Probably at least half of the remixes I did. I always stuck an Amen in there somewhere. Even if it was just quiet, just to give it that that little sort of feel. And then I suppose probably 80% of the FBR core tracks that were coming out in the early days all had the Amen break in them. 
but it was the fledging jungle scene that really embraced the Amen break and paved the way for obsessive producers in all genres. Suddenly a new sound attracts everyone's attention. Bailey, I represent with the One Extra Drum and Bass Show. In the early days, for most people that got into jungle later on, what we loved was you know, the speed of the breaks within those hip-hop tracks. My name is Fabio. We used to do a club called Rage in uh, Charing Cross, and it was like a house night, and it's kind of a lot, a lot of people say that's where Jungle was born. Dylan John for our recordings. Fabio and Groove Rider and uh, Frost and Trevor Fong and all those guys used to play a track called Calm Down, uh, like old hip-hop tunes that had breaks in. Five, four, three, two, one, come down! And they used to mix it in with the house tunes. And that's where I thought, oh, it sounds wicked mixing in with house. And I want to try and make that sort of music. That's where it comes from, really, for me. The mixture, hip house, and they just mixed it all up. Fabian Groove used to play Cole Craig, some sort of uh, bug in the basement at the wrong speed, which they got into trouble for. But it brought that track back to life because it was just like a half-time sort of percussive sort of track. I can't really explain it. But there was all kinds of flavours all in one place. And when you got to about 1990, it started to split. The breakbeats went one way and the house went the other way. So, you know, the breakbeats went on to become Jungle. The first ever Jungle tune that I can remember is a track called We Are E, which had a real uh, four-to-the-floor kind of housey intro. Lenny Diaz, We Are I, it was like the kind of the best example of a track that was accepted in house and in hardcore as well because it had that four to the floor beat. We are Halfway through, they threw the Amen break in, and it, it, for me personally, it started the whole jungle thing. Let me hit you
I'm Chrissy Chris, and you're listening to the story of the aiming break on BBC Radio One Extra. Well, it's always been used in drum and bass. It's the prevalent break. Catch it before it catches you. It's a staple of jungle. Back in the day, aiming break was the one. You hear it every other tune. 50% of the night would be aiming break, definitely. It was a whole scene based around that one break, for me anyway. I don't know if the music would even exist without it. It's hard to, it's hard to know, really. I am Will. And I'm Saul, and we're chasing status. When I was a kid, I was like, oh, there's that silly sounding break again. Oh, I'm bored of that. When I started making music, that's really cool, actually. You kind of ears kind of hear something different. And I think any budding producer who just starts to produce and he wants to make jungle, I'd bet any money in the world, one of the first things they do is find a name and break, speed it up, and they're like, wow, I'm making jungle, because it's so synonymous with that. We have used it many a time on tracks such as Love's Theme. In Love. Copious other ones. Time, uh, time. new single time. 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 You can hear it there. and it's still being used now. This is Jay Magic and this is Wicker Man. I first used it on my first Metalheads release called Your Sound in 1994 or 5. It was one of the only breaks that had a name at the time as well which made it quite unique. But it's probably the only break that's always been kind of it's always been uh, <laughs> incredible. It's always been there. <laughs> Groove Rider. Let's say 60% of the tunes, 70% of the tunes have got an amen break in it. You know, I have done over the amount of years. Fabio. Even my last radio show, I would reckon, now looking back, I would have played five tracks with the amen break in it. That's now. That's without even thinking, though. I don't purposely think, right, wow, it's got aim and I'm going to play it. It's just a part of drum and bass. It is the keystone. It is, it's what makes drum and bass instantly recognisable from any other music because we use it more than any other music form. Even someone said to me the other day on Facebook, you know, damn the first person who ever speeded up the aim and break. <laughs> and do I know who it was because he wants to find him and kill him. So, you know, it's, it's got its detractors, but anyone that's into drum and bass and anyone who's into looping a break will have to say, love it or hate it, it is the greatest break of all time and it will never ever be surpassed. This is Chrissy Chris, and you're listening to the story of the aiming break on BBC Radio One Extra. So, who in drum and bass would we crown king of the amen? Here are the main contenders. One of the most prolific producers for using the amen break would be Busy B. <laughs> Bailey. He's murdered it. I mean, every track he made was. Amen, 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 amen. You just know escaping it with him. Chasing status. Lots of artists are known in drum bass for using amens. Dillinger, who was a, like a legend in the drum bass world, was very well known for really distorting up the amen and making it sound like a completely different break. Dillinger was the first one to make it sound really punchy and fat. He pitched it down, did all sorts of processing to it. No one still knows how he did it. But he made the ultimate kind of the aim and beat. I don't even know if the original drummer would recognise it, really, you know? He's really changed it up. Heavenly bass. The tune's just 
quite mental it's quite edity but uh, you get a, an absolute idea of what Dillinger was able to do with that break he really went in and just ripped it to pieces Dillinger Acid Track it's probably the biggest one that I ever used the aim and breaking Distinctively Ray Keith using it. I tell the DJs what to play, you see? Play back that theater for me, I saw. Accelerate. Accelerate, I think the name of the track was Dub Plate. And you just rolled it in a natural form, just looping it, didn't really cut it up too much, and it sounded beautiful. Ray Keith, he's made maybe a thousand tunes. And I'd say 95% of them, he has used the aim and break. And that's no word of a lie, man. We all, everyone calls him Raymond because he uses the aim and break so much. From Amen to Raymond, sounds like Ray Keith takes the title. What was the first track he used the aim and break on? I cleanly, throughout the whole tune, I think it was Renegade Terrorist. <laughs> When I did that tune, I just wanted to do something that was dubby, but still reggae orientated, that would show that it's about the beats and the bass, and it could be about a vibe, rather than just a random, I nicked the sample and used it. It was kind of a statement at the time. I remember going to Orange that day, that weekend that I'd cut it, and everybody was playing it. And I remember loads of people coming up to me. I remember even Chrome and Time going, boy, how did you get it so clean, right? And I was like, you know, it was just what I wanted to hear. I sampled it from the Mantronics break. I did that with Gavin Nookie um, in his mum's pantry, which we used to use as studio back in the day. We chopped it, we broke it, we reversed it, we, we messed about with it. That break has got other breaks on top of it to fatten it out. So it's got extra kicks, extra snares in the right places. And it was how we processed the break. I still came that break, do you know what I mean? There's so many different sides of that break that you can use. You can use it in a shuffle. You can EQ out all the bottoms and use it as, as almost like percussion. But the million dollar question, would drum and bass exist without the aim and break? It's part of it, but it's not the reason for it. All that break has, has done has enhanced and developed and give it direction. It's not the reason for anything. As much as I love that break and it's in my heart and I use it, it didn't make anything. It just enhanced it. You know, there's a lot of tunes out there. You know, 31 seconds hasn't got an aim and break in it. From the start to finish, Dillinger did tunes without it. Shadow boxing, you know, if I'm just quoting you and giving you examples so people just don't go away and think this is some pro Eamon pipe. Okay, fair enough, I do agree with him. There are other breaks out there, 
but the story is nowhere near as good. Where do we go next after drum and bass? Stinking weather, fat, shaking hands, dirty morning, dark, clumping arms. Little wonder. Well, from David Bowie to car commercials, seems like everyone wanted a piece of the Amen action. But there are some producers that favoured a more extreme sound. <laughs> Equinox's Acid Rain, the Breakage Remix. There was absolutely not another Eamon track I've heard that has, well, ripped it to shreds like that. Just absolutely turned it inside out. On the break course scene, the Eamon break was sped up, mashed up and taken to another level. And if you don't already know, break court sounds a bit like this. Luke Fibert, the man of many aliases, even put out a series of 12s under the name of Amen Andrews. I didn't bother making Jungle for a while, and then maybe early 2000s or 2003 or something started again, but really different, just sort of more like stupid rave style, a bit uh, childish almost or whatever. I was just making them to play out, kind of end of the night, a bit more crazy than the average track. So I just came up with that name, being slightly silly, with the old Irish TV presenter, Amen Andrews, and the fact that I think every track had Amen break in it. under the name of Amen Andrews. But maybe one of the most hardcore Amen followers is based in Germany, where the break became part of a protest against the rise of neo-Nazis. My name is Eric Empire from a Teenage Riot. I also uh, have this label called Digital Hardcore Recording. There was a rule uh, when we started the label that on every record somebody has to do something with that beat. When you reach your beat, it's time to die. And people always looked at me and were like, like, can we really do that? I'm like, yeah, of course we can. You know, we must actually do that. By the time, like 1995, 
uh, uh, happened, uh, we were doing these t these things with that beat where it was just very science like science fiction. <laughs> it's you know a lot of people went like, oh my god, like how much can you push uh, something further into the future? It was amazing. I did a record called Suicide with a large E in the middle instead of the I, <laughs> which was sort of like uh, my hate relationship with the rave crowd at the time because I felt they were not thinking political enough and it was sort of escapism while a lot of racism was growing in, in, in the reunified Germany at the time. There were like people rioting on the dance floor. It was like, what are you guys doing? Where's the four to the four black bass drum? You know, it was like, we were like, yeah, we're not gonna give it to you. <laughs> this sounds to us like marching music from the German troops or something. No, we, we, we go back to funk. It also had that uh, pretty legendary track called Hunt Down and Kill the Nazis, you know, which caused a big discussion. Can rave music be political? Should DJs speak out against racism in such an extreme way? But uh, there was so much violence going on that we thought just throwing a party, uh, <laughs> you know, wouldn't solve the problem. We have to address this. Uh, we have to confront those people. <laughs> it's still being played at demonstrations over here <laughs> from the anti-fascist action and stuff. It's uh, pretty amazing how that... Uh, still uh, uh, is such a kind of key track for many people. I remember reading an article which was the most obscure uh, thing I probably ever read in a, in a neo-Nazi magazine. Uh, somebody showed it to me uh, where they went on and on about they put us on this blacklist and we should be killed and attacked and or put in prison and it all went back to that basically like to using that beat and it, I was like oh my god you know like some of these people <laughs> This is the story of the Amen Break with me, Chrissy Chris. BBC Radio 1 Extra Story. We found out where the Amen Break came from and how it surfaced again and again in various different genres of music. But what's the fascination with the break itself? Why are producers so hooked on it? It's always had like a kind of an aura around it. Well, nothing sounds anything like the Amen. The particular take on that day, the way the microphones were set on the drums, it just came out perfect. What I love about it is the dynamics of it. It's like a hissy cymbal sort of top into it. The funky sort of rolling flow, the way it's been mixed and everything, it's just beautiful. If you're making a tune and like you're stuck and it's not sounding right, all you have to do is put an Amen break in it and then sort it right out. <laughs> if you really want to get that real old euphoric, let's smash the dance floor to pieces kind of vibe. You cannot beat the aim and break. It's pure filth. It's totally saturated, but it seems to work. It's got all the bits you want. Like a single kick, a ride, a snare, kind of little mid bits that great big splash with the kick. and It's really tight. Lots of people have tried to recreate it. The way they played it is a one-off, if you will, and it's been hard to uh, replicate it since. The second or third kick drum before the second snare is in a real awkward place. It's difficult to get the same energy. But I go to sleep dreaming yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah. There are even more far-fetched theories as to why this break is so popular. I'm Michael Schneider. I have been a teacher, a math teacher, for almost 40 years. A student in my college mathematics class asked me if I had any insights into why the Amen break is so popular. So what I did is I found the waveform of the Amen break and I measured the distances between the peaks of the waves and lo and behold, they form golden ratios. And even more surprising, when I took the waveform and matched it up against the human body, the first peak of the wave at the top of the head and the last peak at the bottom of the feet, I found that it corresponded very nicely to the ideal proportions of the human body as described by the ancient Greek ideal. 
It's, it's really quite astonishing, actually. The golden ratio is a mathematical relationship. It relates the parts to each other and to the whole in the same balanced way, such that the whole is the large part of the large part of the small part. Just like the bones of our finger keep adding, each two bones add to make the next bone, and it extends throughout our whole body. It's complex and simple at the same time. Ah, okay, I think my brain is going to explode now. Here's Fabio with another theory. There's just something, like a hidden meaning in that break. It's got an unbelievable power. I once spoke to someone about the word Amen. It's used in Hebrew, it's used in, um, I think, Hinduism, and it's, it's just got this universal meaning. And there is something quite religious about the Amen break because the crowd goes euphoric. More than any other break, you know, there's loads of other breaks. The two-step break, there's the Bobby Bird break, it's, but there's something special about the Amen break. When it kicks in, there's no other break in, in drum and bass that gets the crowd going like the Amen break. J Magic and Wicker Man. There was even these guys called the Amen Brothers who used to come out, come to speed. There's about four of them and they used to go absolutely berserk. Whenever the Amen came on, just you couldn't get near them on the dance floor and they were called the Amen Brothers. They were quite well known in the day. You are like a preacher at a pulpit as a DJ. You're up there trying to kind of like convert everybody and doing your stuff. It's called the Amen Break and it's got this kind of overpowering, overwhelming presence. So, you know, there's got to be something behind the Amen Break. There's, there, there is something special and there's something magical and maybe religious about it as well. Chase and Status. The name gives it sort of um, quite a powerful kind of uh, so, uh, feeling. Grandeur to it, if you yeah. will. But, I mean, I'm going to be super cynical and sorry, Fabs, but... There's no, like, religious connotation behind the Amen for me. <laughs> but I guess that's, that's a, quite a nice warm theory he had there. There's no end of discussion on the web about the Amen break, with loads of databases and lists of tunes. But one of the most shared Amen links is a sound art installation. Where this drum beat was used to promote some sort of purple pill. It's been used so much, I might argue it's now entered into the collective audio unconscious. Here's the guy who made it. Did so about three or four years ago. My name is Nate Harrison. I'm an artist and writer. I live in Brooklyn, New York. It has quite a history to it. This particular drum beat, or rather this break beat. As an artist, I created this sort of sound installation which tells a sort of a history and theory of the Amen Breaks usage over the last 30 or so years. Receiving a lot of attention and making a lot of money with people, and more importantly, corporate bigwigs who held the copyright. I was interested in who owned the record, and Richard Spencer, who is, I think, the sole living member of the Winstons today, was the copyright holder. After this project, I actually had Richard Spencer and some of the other, I had the son of the bass player for the Winstons get a hold of me. You know, I was at first a little scared to hear from them because I thought they were going to sue me or something like that, and far from it, they were actually extremely happy that I'd made this story. They didn't really know what jungle music was or drum and bass music was. They had no idea the degree with which the Amen sample has, you know, proliferated across, you know, across the world, really. And they were, you know, they were kind of like, you know, I hate to sort of say it in these blunt terms, but they were, you know, they were like, who, uh, wh what lawyer can I call to sort of recoup my, my thing here? Because, you know, I didn't, I had no idea that this was this huge. So this brings us back to the thorny issue of copyright. Technically, if you release a track which uses a sample from someone else's track, you're supposed to ask for permission. And usually, you have to pay for it. What better way to pay homage to records that you love but then by like playing with them, you know, musically and rearranging them and recontextualizing them. But not everyone sticks to or agrees with this rule. I've never paid for any sample. I've been nobbled two or three times like because I've never paid. I've always had a hard time about 
beats being something that you should necessarily have to pay for. I believe music is a language and it has to move freely, you know, and we can't have major record labels or major publishing companies, you know, protect uh, certain, like, I don't know, one bars of recording or something and then prevent innovative music from happening. Just before Jungle, about 1990, it was very common for people to sample other people's records and people weren't bothered about it they'd take chunks out of other people's records like whole loops and use it so to find an aiming on somebody else's track and use that was common practice we actually sampled uh, the Mantronics show and I think a lot of other people did as well rather than the, the original Winston's There are so many, many different versions of the aim and break within our music. There was a sequencing bit of software that came out with one of Dillinger's beats as the standard aim and beat on it. It didn't even mention his name or anything. I wouldn't do anything about it because I've sampled someone else's drums. I'd be the hypocrite, wouldn't I, really? So, people have been sampling the aim and break for over 30 years. But according to my research, no members of the Winstons has ever got paid a penny. How do our DJs and producers feel about this? Well, uh, if I could just go like uh, this for a while, I might answer the question. No, I mean, it's hard to say, isn't it? I would be gutted if I played that drum rate, that, that beat and uh, didn't get any royalty. He's owed a lot of money. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of records that are based on your rhythm. That's a difficult one. It's your art and, you know, you don't expect to take a Picasso without paying for it. Musicians deserve to get paid. Um, I don't think they deserve to get paid for longer than about 20 years off of uh, a piece of copyright. I mean, co when copyright started out, it was 14 years long. Now it's life plus 75. I don't think that really makes a lot of sense. That's just basically the corporate mentality and, and generalized greed uh, choking off culture. On one level, I totally understand and I'm feeling that really you should get paid, but James Brown said it and he said, the reason why my career has lasted this long is because of sampling and it's the truth. Their name will go down in history. You know, these guys that made this track, they, they've never done anything else of note, but they will be remembered forever. Maybe in a way that's a form of pay for them. Do you know what I mean? It's immortalised them. Well, let's hear what Richard L. Spencer, original singer from the Winstons and copyright holder of the Amen Brother track, has to say about all of this. We asked him what he remembers about recording the track. We just went into the studio. We had done the A side over a period of time and we needed a B side. And we had this instrumental that we used uh, when we were playing behind uh, Curtis Mayfield and the Impressions. So there was not, it was a fairly uneventful affair for us. It was so normal and so regular, it's almost embarrassing to talk about it, actually, as something special. When did he find out that the break had been sampled in so many tracks? Well, around 1996, I was still in Washington, D.C. I was attending university and working in transit system, and I received a call from a, a record company, obviously there in the U.K., called Strut Records. And there were some young men who were trying to get control of the master to uh, Amen Break. And I, I, I said, well, you know, I own the copyright to the tune, but I haven't had a conversation about any of that stuff in 25 or 30 years at that point. 116 tracks by that time. And how did he feel about it? I felt as if I'd been touched somewhere that no one was supposed to touch. But, you know, your art is like your children. It's like a part of you. And... Uh, it's, 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 it's not like you go around thinking about your children all the time. You love them. I felt invaded upon. Uh, I felt like my privacy had been taken for granted. And again, as a historian, as a social scientist, I also felt uh, like the history of African-American music from the 1800s to the present basically carted off by other people and used, and they became very wealthy and rich. And we usually, you know... <laughs> have been left out. I mean, you know, uh, Big Mama Thornton had to warn the hound dog out before Elvis Presley got it, but Big Mama Thornton died broke. Elvis Presley died almost a billionaire. 
there's no need of me being angry about it. There's nothing really that I can do about it unless people out of the goodness of their heart go, hey, you know, I got this black guy over there and we've taken his music and used it and made money off him. We've never paid it. So, you know, it's just, you almost have to do like we did when we gave up Africa. You just have to kind of say, well, that's the way it is. What would he say to producers that have used the break over the years? I'm flattered that you chose it, but, you know, make it a legal interaction here, you know, pay me. The young man who played that drum beat died homeless and broke in Atlanta, Georgia, around 1996. It might have been a little later than that. Gregory Coleman. Now his kids walking around who were probably struggling. Uh, do the right thing, you know. Uh, you were able to find the music and use it. You know, say, hey, here's, here's son, here's brother, here's a fellow artist, here's your share of the loot. And what does he think the fascination with the Amen Break is? I have no idea. And, you know, I have thought about it and I've listened to other drum breaks from that era. Maybe when you create something, you're not as uh, impressed by it as people who are outside of it. So people came in on a film interview and they had gone down to Lefebvre's studio. They had taken pictures of where the drums were sitting. They wanted to they interviewed the engineer. They wanted to know if there was certain sunlight coming in the studio. I mean, no. <laughs> they have drugs solo. That's it. It was nothing. As a DJ, I've always been more on the side of free use of samples in music. Unless it's someone like Kanye West sampling a track and making loads of money off it. Should the Winstons really have been paid for a six second drum beat? Before we spoke to Richard, I would have said no. But now I've heard this point of view, it's hard not to feel like they should have got some cash for it. Especially when we find out the drummer died penniless and homeless. But where do you draw the line? Should they get royalties for every bit of hi-hat or sneer used? And how would you go about collecting payments from hundreds and hundreds of records that use the Amen Break? It's something that's up for debate, I guess. So what's the future of the Amen Break? I haven't used it for years. If I have used it, it's just been in the background, a little layer, a long time ago, but just, just for the bit that I like, which is the top end of the rides. Well, I haven't personally heard any interesting usage of it, or at least anything that's made me think, oh, wow, something different with Amen, not for a long time. Not that it's had its day, but it's kind of had most things done to it. It's fallen out of favour with some, but it seems like this break will always be used. A couple of years ago, it all my people stopped using it, but it's back with a vengeance suddenly. One of the singers on the record is called uh, Collapse of History and it's uh, using the Amen break. I actually thought about doing <laughs> another maybe full like, double album or something only with that beat just to make a statement. I mean there's so much you can still do, um, you know. As music is secular and, and generational, by the time I got sick of hearing those records, you then get a whole new generation that reinterpret them and change it and then suddenly a few years later it's like oh wow that sounds good again if it's rebuilt in the right way that style can come back again because it's very uh, got a lot of accents to it which a lot of music nowadays is really flat and when it comes to accents there's not much dynamics in it yeah, it can be brought back again yeah uh, we've got loads of tracks on the go at the moment with the aim yeah, it's not dead it's not dead at all it's back with a vengeance for sure I've got three or four tracks at the moment, like, not finished, just in cycle loop mode with Amen in. I can't imagine a time where the Amen break's going to be put to bed. We'll be long dead and buried and our kids will be probably flying around in motors and all the rest of it before that break is dead. That break has stood the test of time. Anywhere, it will forever be sampled, forever, because it's just the greatest break that ever existed. I'm Chrissy Chris, and this was the story of the Amen Break. So to finish, let's have an Amen up in the place for the Amen Break and celebrate with a mini mix from James Lavelle. Uncle, I'd like to talk about drums, or rather, about a particular drum beat. I'm sure you've heard it dozens of times before. This particular drum beat, or rather this break beat, as it is more accurately called, or even more simply just break, is called the Amen, the Amen break. 
Here's what it sounds like. interesting. Hundreds of tracks, dozens of DJs, a number of clubs and events, in effect an entire subculture based on this one drum loop. I mean, based on six seconds from 1969. BBC Radio One Extra presents 100% homegrown. 